Greetings, I'm John Duvall, and this is the Truth Factor Discussion. We'd like to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy week to join us for this period of factoring the truth into our daily lives. Gentlemen, we have a fuller group today than we did last week. Let's start with you, Daniel. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful, brother. I appreciate that very much and, and look forward to our study today. Uh, as we stated a little earlier, we'll be starting in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8. So I'd encourage you, if you've got a, you know, a book, Bible, or, or maybe it's on, online or electronic, pull it out and, and flip over to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8. And, and we look forward to any comments that you may have as well. Brother Paul, how are you doing? Doing wonderfully. Thanks, Daniel. I'm glad to be back with you this week after I was away uh, just for a medical appointment last week. Nothing serious. And so uh, really looking forward to jumping back into the study of Third John. I think it's such a, a beneficial study for us. And sometimes we talk about the atmosphere that was present in John's day and some of the false teaching there, but then we find that the things found in this book are so practical for us today when we go to factor those things as well. So I'm looking forward to our study. How are you uh, doing, Royce? Doing well. And uh, welcome to everybody that happens to be here. And uh, welcome from San Bernardino, California, with fires all around us. But thankfully, all we've got is smoke. But uh, hopefully we're going to light up the devil this morning. <laughs> and, uh, and off to Zane. Hi, Zane. Hey, hey, Royce. I appreciate everyone uh, having me on the program today. I've, uh, very appreciative of that. Excited to get to study with you all again. Got to fill in last week. Uh, I work in El Reno, Oklahoma, and everything seems to be nice here. So. You even sound like you work in Re El Reno, Oklahoma. I no, even sound like it. He's got yeah. a Kentuckian accent. Yeah, well, he got some kind of accent, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> That's all yeah. right, as long as he's serving the Lord. Last week, um, as you if, if you weren't able to join us for our last week's study, um, Paul had to be away, Tom's on vacation, and Royce was unable to be with us. So um, I contacted Zane, and uh, he does a, an internet study as well, and we'll give him an opportunity in a minute to kind of tell you about that. Asked him if he'd like to fill in with us, and he did. So it was just the three of us, Daniel, Zane, and I. However, there was overwhelming emails coming, say, coming in saying, bring Zane back bring Zane back. So when, when I, I heard that, that Tom is still out of town today and Royce might not be here today, I thought, let's make our viewers happy and bring Zane back for another guest spot. <laughs> Give me a little bit and I'll compose those emails and send them out so I won't be a complete liar. <laughs> <laughs> but no, and uh, you know, knowing that Tom will be here and Royce, Royce, um, one of his members had to have surgery uh, late last night, so we had Zane to step in to kind of help fill us in, fill in again, you know, one more time. So I hit the pillow at four fifteen this morning. Well, you you look you look awake. Well, I've been getting telephone calls since seven o'clock this morning. So <laughs> <laughs> the bags oh. under your eyes are not that noticeable, brother. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Well, thank you so much, everyone who's joined us. Um, it's always wonderful when we come together to study the Word of God, to factor the truth into our daily lives. Today, we're resuming on our study through First John with First John chapter three. We left off last week, right in and around verse eight, and I wanted to pick up a little bit with verse eight and a very specific statement there, the latter half of it, and. The, dis the direction that I was taking last week with that verse and the discussion of it, we're going to shift just a little bit, and we'll talk about that here in just a moment. But notice, in any thoughts or comments before we begin with our study, gentlemen? Okay. I like the silence. Okay. Notice here, and I'll bring this up on the screen, we're just going to read verse 8 by it. No, 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 no. Let's don't do that. You, you, you scared you scared us when you said you're going to throw out something new. Man, I'm not saying nothing. <laughs> well, I've got everybody else brought up to speed. I'll catch up with you here in a minute. Right. Um, <laughs> let's start with verse 5. And um, Paul, would you mind reading for us? And there's a reason for this. Starting in verse 5. And let's go ahead, read down through, um, no, I'm sorry, verse 4. And read down through verse 9. First John three four to nine. Uh, let's uh, let's all read together. It says, 
Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor knows him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Thank you, Paul. Now, the reason why I did that is because if you, if without reading that context, what we're about to look at in the latter half of verse 8 doesn't make a lot of sense, and the context really helps to pull it together there. But the latter part of verse 8, John says, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, last week the direction that I had headed in that is more with the question, what works has the devil done that Jesus came to destroy? And that was the question that I sent out on Facebook and the Google Plus earlier today. Which, by the way, you can follow us on Facebook if you haven't already chosen to do that. You can follow us on Facebook at uh, facebook.com slash truth.factoring. Truth.factoring. Um, and we also uh, will submit it via Google Plus as well. But anyway, Royce, this is kind of what uh, the guys and I were talking about a little bit earlier. And Paul had read from a commentary, so I'm, I'm about to throw him under the, under the bus if this doesn't make sense. Um, <laughs> He had read a commentary earlier that, that made a point that I just completely missed altogether. Um, and and here's, here's, kind of, here's, here's what it is. Instead of viewing it as what works of the devil did Jesus come to destroy, more to the point, what works of the devil can we do that Jesus came to take away? Tying it back to verse 5, making essentially works of the practicing. devil being sin. Yeah, back to practicing sin. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, and um, that fits the context better. Uh, you, you think about think about the very first thing we have on record that the devil did, and we assume the angels who left the first estate um, is referencing the the devil. You know, him turning away from God. Okay. Um, if you're watching us and you say, "I know Lucifer. He was cast down," that prophecy in Isaiah is talking about uh, Nebuchadnezzar <coughs> and and not the devil, but. <sighs> His verse, his first act was sin. The work of the devil is sin. And when we engage in sin, we are doing the works of the devil, and Jesus came to take away that sin. Uh, what we had, I think, discussed was that the works, by their nature, uh, are of the devil. That's the kind of works they are, yeah. uh, not who actually performed the individual works. Yeah, and so if we do those things, we are doing what are the works of the devil. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Now that we're kind of looking at it a little bit different light than we did last week. Are you asking me? Any of y'all? But let's start uh, with you, Roy, since you weren't here actually. Well, I think I, I think the point of uh, destroying the works of the devil directly relates to that context. I've always seen that passage, the scene first age especially, as talking about how the works of the devil are circumscribed in our lives. Now you go to you go to the commentary, especially the uh, uh, you know uh, reformed or Calvinistic oriented commentaries. They'll talk about the replaced new nature, you know, the new nature of man, etc. Um, I, I I don't I don't see that that point. You know, they're trying to they have this whole Calvinistic concept. I just think it's just a simple matter of the whole point of of conversion is that our lives change. We stopped doing what we were doing before. Those are the those are the works of the devil, at least, and especially in terms of our own personal lives. Yeah. yeah. I know Zane may have some insight here. This bald guy can learn something too, brother. What do you thought, uh, Zane? I just, I think that fits in with the context. Like you said last week, we took a, a different road with it, but I think that. Uh, the way we're explaining it now, I think that this uh, fits indirectly with what it's talking about, especially with the context. Speaking of practicing sin and practicing righteousness, and it, yeah, 
would, would, just would, eat the bed. Would, would you mind taking a making a sentence or two to describe the direction you took it last week, John? Yeah, I'm, it's. I'm kind it, of intrigued at that. Well, the way the when I looked at it last week. Um, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. So the question was, what what has the devil done? You know, look through the history. What has the devil done that Jesus came to destroy? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't see that at all in this passage. I think well, you, so, you should have been here last week. You would yeah, have helped I, us. I see that this is so tied into, you know, the person who practices sin, verse 4. Yeah. Uh, he was uh, He w appeared to take away sins. Uh, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. You know, that's where that's where the work of the devil is found. Is in terms of that in that that in which we have fellowship, which of course incorporates that broader context in John of fellowship. If you go back and look at the video, you'll see me saying to the to Zane and Daniel, "Let's look at this again next week when we'll have more minds with us or something yeah, like right. that." Yeah. You need, you need my, my rich mind, yeah. We, uh, I think it, it could be connected, too, if you continue that thought throughout the book in chapter 2 and verse 8 when it talks about the darkness is passing away, that just being wickedness or the works of the devil or sin in general, and, and that, that that's why Jesus came to appear. Uh, also, as a side note, as, as part of that sentence, um, notice that he said he appeared, he manifested himself to destroy those works, which shows the importance of Jesus coming in a material body, which would be something that's very uh, opposed to what Gnosticism would teach as far as the material being able to do any good. That's I, was thinking, I was thinking exactly on the lines of Daniel right there. I was thinking back over to chapter 2 mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, context where he talks about um, uh, the one who says he's in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness right. until now. That very important principle right here. If, if if Christ came to destroy the works of the devil, but I say I love my brother, but in fact I hate my brother, the works of the devil haven't been destroyed in my life, and I don't need to lie against the truth by claiming it has. That's, that's right. You know, uh, John, John just breaks things down so simply for us. Uh, there's a statement in this context that I love that is, uh, the one who practices righteousness is righteous. Uh, I just the, the simplicity of that statement is, is so uh, so wonderful, in, in that it uh, some people don't don't view it that way. They have all different kinds of views about righteousness and what that means. And in the context of this verse, there's a verse that we discussed earlier, John, and it's in uh, John 8 and verse 44, where it talks about the works that uh, some in Jesus' time were doing, and it says, "You are of your father the devil." and the desires of your father you want to do, he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Oh, I apologize, you already had that up there. I was behind and, you, though. Oh, I appreciate. <laughs> but when we, when we look at this, uh, this idea that uh, we want to oftentimes draw all kinds of gray areas and things, and, and John just lays it out. If you practice righteousness, you're righteous, and if you uh, are practicing sin, you're of the devil, and uh, yeah. that's just the way it is. Now, Paul, I got to tell you, either this this um, lends to um, exposing a bit of narcissism on my part, or uh, poor wording on your part. But when you first said John breaks it down so simply for us, I thought, thanks, Paul. I mean, I try. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were talking about that John as well until you read the verse, and then I go, I don't think John wrote that, so that's a different one. <laughs> I was sitting in, I was sitting in one of uh, Johnny Edwards' Bible classes once, and he was going to read from one of the epistles, and he says, uh -huh. "Tell us, Paul." And all of a sudden, I started speaking, <laughs> and that was his uh, that was his way of uh, introducing the the scripture that was going to be read by the apostle Paul. So I I fully understand that, and uh, can appreciate. Well, you don't get mixed up if somebody says apostle at the beginning. <laughs> no, no, yeah, sir. that's right. <laughs> Always appropriate to pay attention. That's right. Um, don't you don't you see uh, that? At, at every turn, John really nails what it is to walk in fellowship yeah. with God. Oh, yeah. I mean, he, he just shucks it down to the cob. Now, there's an El Reno expression. 
uh, he, he, t he takes it right down to the base and puts it in such clear terms. Who in the world can deny the examples here? It's like the point that uh, that the apostle Paul makes in uh, Galatians uh, chapter 5, that the works of the flesh are manifest. They're evident. They, they're so clearly seen. Anybody yeah. can see that. Anybody ought to be able to see that the individual cannot say he loves his brother while he's walking in darkness. Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. And by that, it just simply means the working and the power of Satan in our lives. You have the same point brought up in Hebrews chapter 2 mm -hmm. uh, concerning, uh, kind of a little twist on it, uh, concerning uh, all of the, uh, concerning those who's, uh, who've lived all their entire lives uh, in fear of death. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Christ can uh, Christ can set one free from the work of the devil by getting your mind off of death and putting your mind on to life. Yeah, yeah. I've always yeah. I've always just found it interesting that as we read down through this passage that that we uh, we've opened up that down at verse ten that we see that there's two categories. He says, in this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Uh, he only lays out two possibilities there. And uh, it's just, to me, uh, um, again, one of John's just very clear points is that you have to choose which side you're on and where you're going to stand and who you're going to stand with, uh, with the truth and with the Lord, or are you going to follow some other, other way? And so uh, I think that's yeah. a, a good... Uh, I'm troubled. Good point. At, I'm troubled at the concept that we often bring to this this discussion of uh, taking a cue off of what what Paul just said. Uh, this concept of the erring child of God, uh, and I understand what we mean by that, and I, and I'm sympathetic with the desire to try to clarify in the minds of an individual who's found to be in error. Clearly, Galatians six. And verse one refers to such an individual, but uh, you know this passage really nails an idea here that the individual who is not ceasing from unrighteousness needs to think very, very seriously about whether he's a child of God. Period. Well, yeah. is yeah. is he embracing the 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 demand of God in the correction of his life, the the penitent spirit? Uh, is that what he's doing? And if not, is he rather showing himself to be a child of the devil? Yeah, I think, and I think that's a very good point, Royce. I mean, we understand how that we are Christians, are children of God by the Spirit of adoption, Romans chapter eight. But un unlike our own children, okay, our own children, no matter what they do, will always be our children, okay. But the only way we can truly be called child of God is if we behave like God, if we behave as children of God. And while I may be baptized into Christ, if I choose to walk into sin and then begin to behave as a child of the devil, then I'm no longer living as a child of God. I'm now a child of the devil. Isn't this tantamount to, uh, to saying that if, if, I'm, if I'm this child of God but I'm not practicing righteousness, Am I not making God, am I not putting God in fellowship with the works of unrighteousness? Well, sure, and that's why John says in 1 John chapter 1, um, verse 6 there, I'll bring that up real quick. He says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Because if it's possible to have fellowship with dark, to walk in darkness and have fellowship with God, then God has fellowship with darkness. Right, and Paul makes the same point. First Corinthians chapter six: individual yeah. ought not to make the members of Christ uh, uh, to be a, 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 a in party with the harlotry. Yep, exactly. In Luke chapter uh, fifteen, with the prodigal son, in verse twenty-four, the father even talks about that he had a son who was dead, but now he's alive. So Absolutely. there was a sense that he, at the same time, had a son but didn't have a son. And so, you know, part of the ownership of of fatherhood that God takes on is based on what we choose to do in our lives. That's right. That's right. Well, well um. Hmm. <laughs> we, we we do understand that that one can be 
in error, one can be lost, uh, but in in coming back to God, uh, he uh, and, and I understand what Daniel's saying about his son was was lost and he was dead, but he was his son. Uh, and so, uh, in fact, we're told that when we have an erring brother, that we are to admonish him as a brother, a fellow child of God. Uh, yeah. There, there is a difference there between the the erring child of God and someone who's uh, the convenient phrase we use is alien sinner, one who's never obeyed the gospel. Well, you think think about this, and 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 we will. Has anyone been commenting in the chat room, or is everybody just in complete and utter agreement with everything we're saying? I think we're just covering it so good that you know. <laughs> I look at and I understand what Paul is saying. Okay, the the the, the mother, okay, of the of the prodigal son. While he was not living, and therefore, in a manner of speaking, not the son of his father, he was by birth the son of his father, and she did not have to give birth to him again once he came back to the father. Okay, baptism is referenced as a birth, being born again. All right, when one becomes a Christian, they're baptized into Christ. Galatians six um, twenty. Um, Oh, mind blanked. Uh, Galatians 3.27. They're baptized into Christ. They put on Christ. Now, if an individual chooses to depart from fellowship of the Lord, they don't have to be re-baptized in order to be brought back into that relationship, but they do have to repent and to be restored back to the fellowship of God. And so can a child of God be lost? Absolutely. Absolutely. Second Peter chapter three really nails that down towards the end of the chapter there. You know, in Hebrews chapter six, uh, verses four through six as well. That it's possible for someone to taste the fur the the, the, the the fruit, you know, taste of that salvation and to turn away and walk away from it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I think the phrase that we use sometimes in our family relationships are we become estranged. We're we're cut off. We no okay. longer communicate. Yeah. We no longer share in, in all the the benefits of that relationship. And in Galatians 5 and verse 4, Paul there talks about some who were following some false teaching, uh, those who had fallen from grace, and it says that they were estranged from Christ. And certainly I understand that. Please don't uh, misunderstand, uh, because I believe oh, a child yeah. of God can sin so as to be lost. Yeah. But, but they're still... Uh, they may not act like it, and they may bring shame to the brothers and sisters and to the Lord Himself by the way in which they behave. Yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, they are still part of the that family, though they have experienced that disconnect. They've been they've been uh, severed from the benefits of that relationship. Yeah, and hence the fellowship. I yeah. I, again, I, I don't disagree with that. I, I realize there's a there's a struggle that every one of us brings to try to make application of this and still maintain a stand in the truth. But John's statement in this context uh, is that there is something that's very, very evident in this choice that the individual makes. By this, he says, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. Okay, I tell you what. I, I, I like that point. Hold it for just a minute, uh, Royce, and I want to come back to that. Um, mm -hmm. let, let's, let's quickly tie up verse 9 <laughs> so we get on into this next section because I think this, this continues the thought here and does so very well. I, uh, think, Zane, I, jump, I think I jumped the, the limit to where I had read before, and I apologize for that. Oh, no, no, that's, that, that's fine. That's fine. Zane, um, in verse 9 there, he says, whoever has been born of God does not sin. I think in, in something you said earlier kind of identifies this thought that we've been looking at. It's talking about continually sin, you know, sinning Practicing. and not repenting, not turning back there. Practicing sin. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but it's interesting, when Zane, when he says his seed remains in him, would that be his word? Uh, I was kind of considering that as I was studying through here. Um, I guess I was kind of looking at it as more of, uh, you know, it, we are born of God, and uh, we, mm -hmm. in a way, we kind of share of what God uh, is. Um, God cannot sin, so therefore, because we are born of God, it's kind of like DNA with our fathers. You know, if, if uh, my parents both have DNA, they're, they're both white, I can't be born black. So if I'm truly born of God, then I can't sin. 
Now, again, that goes back to practicing, but, but again, that's kind of how I was looking at it. Well, um, it, and I wouldn't disagree with that. I mean, if, as long as the Word abides within us, right. every every temptation, every crossroad, every act, every act, everything that we face within our life should be governed by the Word, and therefore we make the right choice at that right moment. And if we make the wrong choice, then we take the next step, which is right, to repent and come back to God. Yeah, you can connect those two thoughts because it's the Word that causes us to be born again. We're born again uh, of incorruptible seed, Peter makes the point. Yeah, First uh, Peter 1, 1 20, 23. 23, yeah. And you got the, the seed, uh, Luke 8. Yeah, and the parable there, the planting of the seed, the seed is the Word there. So yeah. the, there's, not a, there's not a disagreement there, just a little different yeah. way of stating it. Yeah. Exactly. Some translations, I think Daniel, the ESV, doesn't it render, uh, use the phrase, practicing? Practicing, yeah. NASB does say yeah. that. Yeah. Um, yeah. If we confess our sins, hold on, wrong, wrong chapter. <laughs> um, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Because every, every sin must be followed with repentance. If not, then you sin again. And again, yeah. All right. Any other thoughts or comments? We do have a comment in the chat. Uh, it's from Rhonda Duval, and she up. says uh, there in the chat. Go ahead. Uh, it says we can't run around with the devil all week and expect God to accept our worship on Sunday. God wants our hearts, minds, and actions for Him every moment of every day. When we work for God every moment of every day, the work of Satan has been destroyed in our life. By Jesus coming into the world, and I appreciate that. That's a good statement, Rhonda. Yeah, I think very, very well stated. Absolutely. Uh, there's a there's a point Johnny Stringer made in an article on Truth Magazine. I just put it there. I just put it on the. Uh, I'll bring it up here. Right, go ahead, Royce. Uh, the, look at his point. He said Johnny Stringer says uh, the solution to this problem is found in a point that's often overlooked. Uh, the tense of the verb is born. The verb tense which John uses proves he's not talking about everyone who was ever born again. He's not saying that anyone who was ever born again does not live in sin. The King James says whoever is whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. It does not say whosoever was ever born of God does not commit sin. Um, I had seen that quote, oh, I don't know, some time ago, and I thought to myself, uh, that's actually a pretty pretty careful observation on that passage yeah. yeah it's 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 um and I've I've just drawn a blank on the text but the apostles Paul makes a point we carry about in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus so this life may be manifested in our life and well, that's how it's same, done and you have the same thing with Paul in his own life where he said you know what I have to push I have to subject my own body lest after having preached to others I myself should be cast away yeah yeah same exact the same uh, issue. Yeah. First Corinthians nine. Nine twenty-seven. Twenty-seven. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. So with that being said, let's go ahead and and continue because the thought does continue beginning there with verse ten, especially the particular thought we've been building upon. And so um, Daniel, if you would read for us beginning in verse ten, and let's read down through to fifteen. Okay. Fifteen there. Let me get to your translation. Not your translation, but translation. <laughs> yeah, my use. personal one. I, I work <laughs> I, on it. I can wish. I ask you, can I ask you a, a, an indulgence here? Uh, limit that reading to verse 12. Keep that within the strict, without going to the next, into the next thought, which is uh, the relationship of the world to us. Sure. Would you mind? That's fine. Yeah, Daniel, just go 10 through 12 for the moment. Sure. Uh, it says, By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Okay, I think that is a very good stopping point their voice with that. So let's back up. We've already touched on this uh, several times, which is perfectly fine. But I love the way he starts this. The English Standard Version says, by this it is evident who are the children of God. Um, 
I, I really like that phrase, by this it is evident who are the children of God. Now, Royce touched on something earlier in, in quoting from what Johnny Stringer, I think, I think it was, wrote. Right. He says, whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother, for this is the message, and so forth. He goes on. He doesn't use the idea of has never been a child of God. He's talking about that moment, the moment where we engage in sin or don't engage in sin. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, who, but I know that whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. It doesn't say has never been of God. But at that moment where, you, where you're not practicing righteousness, then you're not living as God would have you live. You're not of God. Any thoughts? Isn't it interesting that he throws that last phrase in there again? <laughs> Nor is he who does not love his brother. It, it, to me, it strongly suggests that during this time frame, there was an issue that, that he has to deal with off and on with the way brethren were treating one another. Well, certainly, uh, John, when you look at that, you see... Uh, that that to have a relationship with the Father, you have to treat your fellow children of the Father in, in the proper way. And that, that's a theme. Like you said, he, he comes back to this, and this isn't the last time he comes back to it in this book. Right. Uh, it, it's a, a thought that keeps going forward. And that's something that, that we can take to heart today. Uh, how do we treat and how do we regard the, the fellow children of our Father? Uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ in, in the local congregation and, and across this whole world. Do, do we have a, a closeness with them and, and a care for them? Uh, do we treat them properly? Uh, if we are not uh, actively treating them properly, uh, we cannot have the right kind of relationship with the Father that we claim that we have. Let me jump off of something that point. John said. And I will tell you, th this has uh, been a head-scratcher for me for 40 years. As a matter of fact, I've scratched it so much, I scratched all the hair off. Uh, the, the focus in John on loving one another is so clear and so pronounced. I have to wonder what exactly were the specific circumstances that were existing among the people of God in that day that John plows that ground, then replows it, then replows it again. I, I, I'm not sure, well, I'm, I'm convinced I don't have a, a clear sense of why this is such a compelling point for John. If I, if I move it away from the point that the Lord made in John chapter 13, that by this men will know that you're my disciples if you have love toward one another. I'm wondering yeah. if what is really at the base of John's point is e evangelistic in its nature. That who, who can we be in destroying the works within ourselves to influence others that the, that the works of the devil are destroyed in their lives if we're not loving one another, who in the world would ever want to become a part of a body of people who are identified by anything other than love among them? I, I, if that's not what it is, yeah. I'm telling you, I, I don't understand what is the broader context of that love. I think that's very plausible um, or replausible. <laughs> Sorry. You talk too I, uh, long. It would have been funny. <laughs> Morris, um, do do you mind if I switch gears and and ask you a question? Yeah. Um. Do you like as far as w with the comment from uh brother Stringer, or, um, if I pronounce his name right, do you think that ties in somewhat with chapter two about those who are from us but they're not of us, to where it doesn't necessarily mean that they've maybe not necess ever been part of the church, but that currently they're not. Uh, followers of Christ. Hadn't really, hadn't really thought about it. It's possibly, uh, it's possibly a point to, uh, point to consider. I, I don't know. I hadn't really thought. Of, I hadn't put that connection there. I'm just, I'm, I'm coming into this, this uh, highly focused uh, point that John makes over and over and over again about the, about love among the brethren. Uh, 
it, there's no question that in terms of the immediate practical uh, way in which we interact with one another, if love's not present, you know, how can we even stand to be in the presence of one another? But what is the broader purpose of that love if it is not to say to others, you're not a part of this family, wouldn't you like to be? Wouldn't, wouldn't you like to be a part of a family that is characterized by this kind of love? Well, let me let me present a, a different possibility, Royce, and and I, I'm not going to say that that's not oh, that's not hey, exactly I, what he was doing, you know. I, but I, con I love it. consider an, another approach to it. Um, it could have been for the very protection of of the church. If Gnosticism was developing the way that commentaries suggest that it was, you would have had a rift growing within the church at that time period, a, a, a rift between those Christians who were following after the Gnostic way of thinking and the Christians who were staying grounded in the Word of God, much like the Christians throughout Galatians, Galatians chapter 1, 6 through 9, who was turning towards uh, the perversion of, the, of Christianity by the Judaizing teachers. And to me, it, it, the warning wouldn't be for the benefit of those Christians who had chosen to follow the Gnostic teachings, but maybe for the benefit of those Christians who remained grounded and the way that they viewed those erring brothers, telling well, them actually, not to hate them but to love them. That actually brings up the point that Daniel was making a minute ago. Does it go back over yeah. there about those who who are are not of us? They've shown that they're not of us. They prove they've proven that they are not of us because they went out from us. Uh, is is there a is there a sense in which family stays together? Uh, family depends upon one another. Family respects where one another are coming from. And if we're seeing one another as family, we're less likely to walk away. Maybe that's maybe that's part of it. That uh, that, that there's a hortatory or even an yeah. admonitory sense in, involved here. In trying to keep the faithful brethren in with the family, yeah. hence the multiple references to children of God. Correct. It, it, do you think this could idea because it's my belief that Revelation was written around the same time as First John, mm -hmm. but the the church is it Ephesus who lost their first love, uh, but yet they're they're doctrinally sound. They're able to weed out all these false teachings, but in doing that, it seems like they forget to love people in general. And, and that may, love may be something different, but that in weeding out false doctrine off. In times, it, you know, you may even know a congregation like this that's so tenacious that they forget. Well, we gotta love people, and we gotta show our love for our brothers and sisters, and not always just be skeptical of everybody, but actually enjoy our family that we have here. Well, we're asking that. a lot of questions about what it was like in, in John's day, but I don't know that it's it's a lot different than what some churches experience today, in that. Uh, you see that some brethren do not treat one another properly. Uh, they don't have a love and, and a care, a concern for their brothers and sisters that they ought to have. And so I don't think it should be really surprising. It, it, it's appalling. It's awful. It's, it's, it's terrible. But it's much like it, you know, what, what we see in John's day was like what, what some experience today is that sometimes Christians, unfortunately, don't treat one another properly. Uh, I've, I've known of, of places... Thankfully, uh, not here, but uh, known of places where there were people who would come to the assembly and not speak to one another. They would not sit on the same side of the building as one another. Yeah. And folks who tried to uh, work that out said, oh, this has been the way that it's been for uh, 10, 15, 20 years. And I think the original issue of whatever had the bee in the bonnet was forgotten. And, and those kind of things just have no place among God's people. And, and you can't you can't be a child of the father, and treat your brother and your sister badly. I appreciate and, it. Daniel. And those congregations may be labeled quote unquote sound congregations. They may teach the right doctrine, but the inner workings aren't sound. <laughs> They're not healthy. I, I appreciate the point that Daniel is making, but um, I, I just I just warn against. Uh, taking the position that because we come down hard on issues, therefore we don't love. I think the fact that we come down hard on issues uh, that, that the Lord uh, ha has has given us establishes that there there's a broader sense of love 
there's some something different that's driving that. I I I don't like the perception of because this church stands for the truth, therefore they're not loving. You know, maybe they're standing for the truth because they are loving, and you're in the devil. Typically, though. And go ahead. I said typically. Reputations are built like that, not because people took a stand for the truth, but the mannerism wherein they went against the brethren who were in error. And and for the record, I have a, a personal opinion that I or a personal personality. I don't know how else to say it. <laughs> that uh, you know, I'm very tenacious against false doctrine, and that's something that I have to continually remind myself: is in your tenacity against sin, against false doctrine, don't forget to do it the right way and show your love for people. So I hope that it wasn't taken that I said somehow we're supposed to be less ferocious against false teaching, but I, I just think that in that sometimes there are people who do forget, and, and I think the church of uh, church at Ephesus in the book of Revelation may have been one of those. Well, let, let me give you an example, and we how much time we've got? Okay, we've got a little time here. Debates, okay. I think that there is a time and place for debates, all right, among, among preachers. However, have you ever have you ever sat with a group of preachers from one side and talking about debate and they'll say, Boy, he whooped up on him. He tore him up. He let him have it. He just laid him on the ground and he stomped on him. Well, now if you're talking about a football game, yeah, that's proper language, I guess, but should that be the the, the, the approach that we take when it becomes doctrinal differences between brethren and we're trying to sit down and study it together? Should it be our goal to stomp on him, to, to really put him in his place and show him where he's at? When I, uh, when I debated Jack Langford uh, back in the 1970s in Irving, Texas, and then in Fort Worth at the Irving building for four nights, and then at uh, the Fort Worth building of Langford's uh, group, uh, Jess Jenkins moderated for for me, Jesse Jenkins, mm -hmm. and Jess gave me some good advice. I was a pretty young preacher, about I was, I was about the age of uh, Brother Sam. Yeah, just about. And uh, Jess gave me some good advice. He said, "Roy, never forget a debate is not about winning an argument. It's not about winning an argument. It's about the truth being presented." Yeah. Yeah. Ultimately, that's where it has to come back to. Yeah. And isn't that really what the context, what is the ruling context in First John chapter 3? Yeah. We have two comments in the chat room. Just Okay, thank you very much. I didn't have those um, up the screen, my bad, on that one. Yeah, we have um, a Mark, Mark Roberts uh, who's joined us. Good man. Let's see. And Mark, where are you from? Uh, if you He's want Texas. to share that with us. Irving. Irving, Irving, Texas. Been at West Side and Irving for years. Yep, Done okay. an awesome job there. Uh, he says, uh, "Concern this. It's called clicks, and it's notori notorious anywhere you go." It's and -E -E yes, Mark. Mark's a good preacher, but he can't spell. <laughs> Royce knows Mark. <laughs> he can say that. Well, I was wondering if it was the same same Mark that was from Texas or not. So, yep. uh, but anyway, he says that's why A don't speak to B. Uh, shouldn't be this way, but is in every church, school, business. Uh, shouldn't be in the church, but they are. And those are those are good comments about uh, the way in which we our, our personalities interact with with others. Uh, again, not not uh, discounting the stand for the truth, but uh, what we need to be, what we need to be doing, right? Yeah. And I think there's a there's a time and a place, and we need to do our best to to give a good judgment to where you know every time Jesus presented a lesson, he wasn't beating up people, but at the same time there were times where he called people sons of the devil, uh, and and you know the same with Paul's preaching, you know when uh, you know he was dealing with. Lydia, he wasn't saying, "Hey, look, you idiot, this is what it is." Um, but I'm sure he was kind-hearted within that, and and so I think we need to, as as preachers and just Christians in general, be uh, aware of the environment, who we're speaking to, what the context is, and and take all those factors into account and use our best judgment in that. Uh, lest uh, lest we be thought to be unkind, let's hit the point that John made once again. By this, the children of God. And the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. I don't know how more clear 
it could be made. You know, if you're not practicing righteousness, don't fool yourself. Don't lie against the truth. The reality of the matter is you're not reflecting the God life that's supposed to be ruling in your life. That's exactly right. There's um, an old there's an old uh, preacher story, and I always am uh, skeptical of preacher stories, whether they're true or not. <laughs> but uh, Amen. an old preacher story that I think is uh, is attributed to uh, Alexander the Great, and there was a, a traitor within his ranks, and he calls him to him, and he says, "And what's your name?" And he says, "My name is Alexander." And he says, "Well, uh, you need to either change your name or change your ways." That's a shortened version of that story, and. Uh, sometimes I think that, that God would just about prefer for us to do that. We call ourselves Christians, but we don't behave like it. Uh, and so we ought to either uh, change one or the other, hopefully yeah. change our ways. Okay, I want to, I want to bring, a, bring a, another connection here within this. All right, we, we, we stopped with verse 12. Zane, I'm going to throw this to you. Let's go ahead and read verses 13 through 15. And um, I'm, there's a point I want to make in regards to uh, another connection within this text that we need to keep in mind as well. So let's continue there, Zane, and read 13 through 15, please. Verse 13. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Okay. I remember we mentioned earlier that he came to destroy the works of the devil. And we were talking about the works of the devil being sin. It sounds like that John in verses 10, this whole section here, is talking about probably one of the greatest works of the devil that Christians oftentimes fall prey to. And that is hating one another and not having the proper love for one another. And it was a problem in Corinth. It was a problem throughout the first century, um, and it's a problem today. And many times we, we, we will plaster it over, paint, paint over it by, by good words and nice words. We're inside. We just can't stand to be around someone. And I've heard people say, say I, I, I hate him. I don't like him. I can't stand to be around him. But yet to their face, you'll smile and say, oh, that's such a nice dress you have on, or a nice haircut. Or my um, my favorite. Yep. Well, I, I, I love him because God tells me I have to, but I really don't like him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you make a good Pharisee. You know what? I don't even like myself sometimes. Amen <laughs> to that. Uh, you know, you don't like Royce either? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I, did it. I, I was not careful in my words. I hate myself as well sometimes. That's Thank you. I appreciate that. See, uh, I almost said are, it jokingly. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder sometimes if we really understand the impact of that statement. This ties in exactly what the Lord said of the Sermon on the Mount too, when He said, uh, "You've heard that it was said of old that you love your neighbor and you hate your enemy, but I say to you, don't be angry." Yeah. Uh, the reality of the matter is, I I wonder sometimes if we don't differ from the murderer. Only by matters of degree, by matters sometimes of opportunity. We, we might not commit the actual act of murder, but we do a pretty good job of uh, destroying the character of an individual or destroying an individual's reputation. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Look at, look at what it was have, that caused Cain have. to uh, get stirred up like he did. Uh, what caused Cain to get stirred up like he did was... Uh, his brother's works were righteous and his were evil. It was pointed out to him that his worship was unacceptable to God. And when his error was pointed out to him, that's when it just enraged him uh, to the point that he, he hated his brother and killed him. I wonder how different it is today. Well, I would like to think that Ad that Abel was not saying, nye, 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 nye. You know, uh, but sometimes those who work evil they, they see that anyway. They they're they're in they're imputing that to uh, to what uh, you know. If, if Abel's right, he's just right. Yeah. I'm, and uh, th that has nothing to do with Cain. Uh, Cain needs to get right. Just, right. just like yeah. if you talk about homosexuality today, everybody thinks that somehow by you saying homosexuality is a sin, that you hate everybody and that you're trying to be God and judging. 
<laughs> and and they just yeah. jump to those assumptions. But the fact is, it's not true. So now here's an interesting con- kind of continue to connect the dots here a little bit. Cain got mad at Abel. Our Abel had done righteous works. Cain's brothers were evil. Cain got mad at Abel. He says, "Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you." All right. Well, still the topic seems to be that we are to love one another. Obviously, he does make a comparison that the world is going to hate us just as Cain hated Abel, because we're, we when we try to walk. It's kind of like this: when we try to walk in the light, then everything in the darkness is manifested. It is made known, and so we will receive this type of treatment. We don't need to be surprised at that, but we should not be turning on one another and and not having that hate for one another. And and actually the, the point that's made in verse 13 extends the idea that I was suggesting that maybe mm-hmm. there's an evangelistic sense that's connected to how we love one another so that the world will know that you're my disciples, as Jesus put it. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a good point. Are any other thoughts on that? Before we move farther, I had a question. Yeah. Uh, we didn't we didn't hit it on our last section, uh, but in verse eleven it says, "For this is the message that you heard from the beginning." Um, from there, I was wondering, is it talking about the beginning of creation or the beginning of their discipleship, from the beginning of their teaching? And uh, you know, I understand that it kind of ties in there with Cain, so it might make you think from the beginning. But I don't know if it, is that just using an example. But what what exactly is the beginning in this passage? Or, or the or the beginning of the instruction from Christ, say in John chapter thirteen. Uh, Remind well, me of the verse again. John verse 13, eleven thirty six. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, um, when you Zane, when you look at this, I think that we've seen the word beginning used in a couple of ways, haven't yeah. we? Yeah. Uh, we have seen it used about uh, the beginning of their faith, but I'm not sure about this because uh, we read in verse eight. Uh, where we began today, he who sins is of the devil, and the devil has sinned from the beginning. From the beginning. And it's obviously not talking about the beginning of just their faith. I mean, that's not when the devil started sinning. Uh, but uh, so uh, probably but, within the context of Cain and Abel, we might look at uh, that that's been a message uh, uh, from God uh, for always and all time. It's not just an Old Testament doctrine. It's not a patriarchal doctrine. It's not a law and the prophets doctrine. That, that you ought to love your brother is something that God has always taught. But uh, I'll be quiet now and let the other fellow speak. In well, verse 11, I think it takes the same idea as chapter 2 and verse 7, that it's, it's the first time they heard the gospel or the beginning of their discipleship, somewhere around there, because of this. It says, this is the message that you right. have heard from the beginning. He makes it personal. He doesn't yep. say that the message that has been heard from the beginning. He says that you have heard from the beginning. And so yeah, he identifies the people who first heard it. So when did they first hear it? Well, they could I don't think they could have heard it from the the beginning of creation, but that's the reason that I take that position personally. Well, but uh, the immediate context of that statement in 1 John chapter 3 goes directly into not as Cain, who was of the evil one. What's interesting is uh, there is no place in that in in the Genesis connection right there where God says, okay, because he's your brother, you're supposed to love him. Cain, you have to love your brother. Abel, you have to love your brother. That's not found there. But that's not found there at all. And yet, right. he is his brother. And and John makes this point. Uh, Jude uh, picks up the same idea. Uh, here, Here's an individual who, who, slew, who, who slew his brother. Why did he slay? Why did he slay him? Well, because his deeds were evil. Yeah. And his brothers were righteous. Now, so there is that brotherly connection there, but there is that base also, that moral connection, of one man's works are righteousness and one man's works are wickedness. Okay, Zane, any thoughts? Uh, I think that the, you know both sides offered some pretty good evidence. I mean that's that was just something I was debating with in my mind as I was looking over this. You know what is it talking about? Because you can take it either way, and I suppose either way it could could be right. Um, but but definitely you know I mean it does say I guess as uh, Brother Daniel said, as you have heard, I I guess I didn't uh, consider that part of it too much. But, that that would be the approach that I would take. 
that you know you, this is what you've heard from the beginning that you need to love one another. Don't be like Cain who killed Abel. Okay, but you've heard from the beginning that you need to love one another would be the way that I would I'd look at that as well. I don't I don't object to that. I I was looking at it a little differently. Uh, I want kind of wonder if possibly the message uh, that they heard was a message that was from the beginning, but uh, and, but, and it, but I'm I'm not not terribly uh, argumentative about that. But uh, if anybody wants to terribly. fight about it, you know, uh, I'll hate you and I'll punch you in the nose. No. <laughs> Let me just add add <laughs> something else. Case. As in verse 7 that it talks about the message that they heard from the beginning, he also emphasizes that it's a new commandment, but it's an old commandment at the same time. And so just because it was the message they heard from the beginning doesn't mean necessarily that it's the first time that God ever taught anybody this message. Um, so I would just offer that perspective in, in, in light of these passages. Thanks for making my argument for me there, Daniel. Uh, let, me, let, me, uh, let me make an observation here. You know, uh, Paul was correct on something, and not the apostle I'm talking about, this Paul here. Uh, you might uh, want to write this down somewhere. Yeah, write, the, <laughs> write this down, guys. Um, the study of the word beginning in the epistle, in, in the first epistle, well, actually, in the gospel also, but in the first epistles where I, where I did a particular word study on it, the use of the word beginning in first, in first John is actually quite interesting. Yes. It's not just one beginning. Yes. It, it's, it's the one who was in the beginning with God. It's the beginning of, of your faith, the beginning of your walk with God. It's, uh, it, it, it's several different concepts of beginning that are here. It's a great word study. In, in yeah. verse 1, I even take the, the mindset that it's, it's from the beginning, even preceding the beginning, if you will. So not even at the beginning, but preceding the beginning. Yeah. Uh, Before there. the foundation of the world. Yeah. yeah. In the beginning, he was. Okay. Um, let's 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 get to the end of the beginning discussion. And um, <laughs> a couple comments in the chat room, and then uh, we're about to run out of time. Matter of fact, I'm looking at the time, and we are just, I think, right about time. Um, a couple comments in the chat room, real quick. Let's bring in uh, Brother Mark Roberts. He reminds us that fear God and keep his commandments. That's the whole duty of man, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. And then he says, love one another for love is of God. He who knows God is born of God. Quoting there from a statement, of course, made by the Apostle John. And, um, and then a passage, I, I, Royce referenced this, and I just dropped it into the chat room, John 13, 35. I think Royce referenced it. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Um, verses 14 and 15, real quickly, he makes the point there, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Now, spiritual death or physical death? been spiritual, wouldn't it? Okay, the spiritual separation from God. If an individual has been born again by the blood of the Lamb, or go ahead, Royce. Well, how do we see that in that context? In the very in the last phrase in verse fourteen, he yep. who does not love abides in death. Exactly. That's how that, you see it in that context. That's a good point because you are living physically, Correct. but yet you are dead, spiritual death. Okay. Yep. Um, now, I guess here's my point: we could take a whole study and talk about this verse and show what spiritual death is from the scriptures and how that spiritual death entered the world. Do we want to do that or do we want to go ahead next week and just kind of talk about verse 14 and then get on into 15 and proceed more forth through the uh, remainder of the chapter? Well, 15 opens up a real can of worms with the has no eternal life abiding in him, especially when you see the past tense of verse 14, we know that we have passed out of death into life. So okay. I suggest that we probably ought to hold on 14, 15 until next yeah. week because I think it's going to be a can of worms. I'm thinking so too. Um, I think no, I disagree. I think it's going to be a kettle of fish. <laughs> well, you see, that's we, what happens when you let a Yankee rule. <laughs> if we shuck the corn properly, then we'll have a good discussion of it. Absolutely. <laughs> if we yeah, I thought that was a corny quote you used anyway. So, if we get more guys like uh, like Zane and Daniel with hair, it might be better. So. <laughs> I'll tell you this: this has been a pretty good study today. But uh, 
I just really don't appreciate the way that Zane has monopolized the conversation. Uh, he is that way, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd, I've I've had to mute him a few times. He's just jumping in there too much. <laughs> I tell you what, um, let's go ahead and plan to pause the study for today. We will resume next week with verse 14. Uh, there are, there are, there is a, well, I'm not, my English has gone out the window. There are a good bit of stuff here we need to think about. A plethora? <laughs> yeah, there is a plethora of stuff um, that we can really talk about. And I, re I recognize that sometimes in these studies we may not make fast progress as far as from verse to verse. And maybe sometimes we're, you might think we're looking too close at the painting, getting too close to the details of it. But there are a lot of times where learning how to factor the truth of God's Word into our lives is seen within the details. And so that's why we take our time through this study. And we really appreciate you joining us and taking the same time with us. Um, any, any thoughts or comments uh, before we close? Let's start with you, Daniel. I just want to thank everybody for their time. I know time is precious, and we appreciate that you've spent it with us and appreciate the, the comments in the chat room as well. Thank you. Definitely. Paul? We're just glad you've joined us today, and um, I'll just say personally, if you're ever in uh, south-central Indiana, uh, make your plans to stop by and see us here at Ellettsville. You'd be very welcome, and I'd love to meet any of you. Uh, if you're ever traveling through, you're welcome at all of our services, and if there happens to be someone locally here, I uh, would love to have you visit with us as well. Uh, Royce? Uh, it's good to be with everybody. I'm honored to be uh, a part of this. It's always a pleasure to be with you, brethren. I, I wish I could uh, know each of you in a, in a very personal way, but we are many, many miles away from one another. It's good to see those that uh, drop in, uh, in the chat room from time to time. And good to hear from Mark uh, Roberts, who's a dear brother and uh, highly, highly respected. Good to, good to hear from you again, Mark. Um, just uh, want to let you know we have an evangelism effort uh, going to be kicking off here in October, middle of, middle of October. And if anybody's interested in putting in a, a good week of work, we'll be happy. Uh, we'll be more than happy to take your donation of time, which basically means you ain't going to get paid for it. <laughs> um, Zane, thank you so much for joining us. Um, there has been a minor change in the broadcast, the, the day of your broadcast of what we talked about last week. Is that correct? Right. Yeah, we uh, moved it from Monday at 8 p.m. to Fridays at 8 p.m. We will not be doing it this Friday. We're going to start back up on the 30th of August and uh, go from there. So. And that's GodHathSpoken.com? Right. That's at GodHathSpoken.com. And there's, of course, more information on different online studies at that site. So. Okay. Okay. GodHath, H-A-T-H, Spoken.com. Yeah, de definitely check that out if, if you haven't done so yet. I think the, the first one they did together, they did a good job. And um, the fella the fella who is doing that with you, his last name is Cox, right? Right, that's Jeremiah Cox. He's working with Brother Harry Osborne in uh, the 84th Street congregation there in the city. So. And he, he's Stan Cox's son. Stan, Stan's yes. boy. Yeah, mm -hmm. Stan's, Stan's boy. <laughs> You know, I had someone. I had someone the other day. Uh, just, just, just assumed Daniel was my son. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but if you have any questions, or go ahead, uh, Royce. Uh, I was preaching in Odessa, Texas, when uh, Stan was baptized. Oh, wow. oh really? Yeah, yeah. And and he's an old guy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, listen, we'd like to thank you so much for joining us today. If you have any questions or comments, you can send them to us directly at questions at truthfactor.com. You'll see the address on the screen, questions at truthfactor.com. Or you can write to each of us individually. Just use the first name, Daniel, Paul, Tom, Royce, John, at truthfactor.com. You take a pick, and we'd be more than happy to consider what you have to say, maybe bring it into next week's discussion and incorporate it into our study. So thank you so much for joining us today, and Lord willing, we will see you back here again next week at 11 o'clock Central Time. That would be noon Eastern Time. Nine Pacific Daylight Savings Time. And 7 p.m. if you live in Mogadishu, Somalia. Right here at live.truthfactor.com. Have a wonderful week.